Well, what a distinguished panel we have here. Uh, Dr. George uh, at Princeton, in fact, was on the board of the Family Research Council 21 years ago and interviewed me when I came. So at least you made one good decision, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> You, you've pointed out that Christians and conservatives have been working successfully to defend the principles of life and marriage and family in the Republican Party for over 40 years. But what moderates and liberals couldn't do in 40 years was done overnight and actually within just a couple of hours this year in the Republican Party. Speak to that. It was tragic and it was disgraceful. Tony, you had a bird's eye view. You were in there fighting, trying to do your best, just trying to get your voice heard so that uh, we could fight as we had fought for 40 years, successfully until that moment, uh, to uphold our party's commitment, formalized in the platform language, uh, to protect the innocent born, unborn child against the lethal violence of abortion. Uh, the, the best and the brightest on the liberal side in the Republican Party had tried for all those decades to eliminate that language. We fought off figures like Arlen Specter and Robert Packwood and people like that. And yet, here, they swept in, they eliminated the language, they didn't give you or others an opportunity to even make the case for the child in the womb, you didn't have a right to speak, you didn't have a right to be heard, and suddenly the language was gone, swept away, together with any reference to marriage as right. the conjugal union of, of husband and wife. It's a tragedy and a disgrace. How did we get here? I think we allowed people to believe that they could have our vote without earning our vote. We gave up any leverage we had. We allowed ourselves to be left with no place to go because the prospects, the only other prospects, the prospects on the other right. side were unthinkable. And so here we are today, a movement that was once strong and robust, now weak and ineffective. Let me tell you something about the, I know a thing or two about Democrats because where I live and work, uh, liberal Democrats are, are the norm, I'm the, I'm the odd fish. Let me tell you something about them, something we can learn from them, something I admire about them. They do not let their politicians deviate. They do not let their politicians adopt a view for purposes of political expediency. Um, they do not accept the argument that, well, our view is now in a minority and it's electorally dangerous for us uh, to, uh, to come out in favor of that view. Uh, we have to pretend, at least for now, to be on the other side or to soften our view in order to get elected. The left understands that that doesn't work in the long run to the advantage of the causes that they believe in. And we can learn something from them, Tony. We should never again allow ourselves to be in a position where we have no leverage, where people own our votes, where they don't think they have to, politicians don't think they have to earn our votes in order to get our votes. We're gonna talk more about that in a, in a, in a moment because I think we've gotta help people understand you're not saying don't vote. No, no, no. You're saying use your voice along with your vote. And, and Katie, you've been doing that. Your organization, championing children. You've said that a, a biblical worldview, an understanding of Scripture, and as Christians walking that out, always comes down to the benefit of the child. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And I just think... That is actually the heritage. I would say that that is one of the manifestations of our pure and undefiled religion before God is child protection. It is and it always has been. It was in the first century into the pagan world that the church was born into that we actually humanized and dignified the child in such a way that we actually transformed all of society. So we need to do that again. We need to look at every major cultural, legal, technological, and electoral issue through the lens of elevating the child, putting their well-being first. And the incredible thing about when you do that is you not only get child thriving, you get national thriving. There's something about prioritizing children, elevating their rights, elevating their needs above what it is that adults want 
that actually leads to a flourishing society. So I would say that as, you know, and we're going to talk a little more about that this afternoon when I, when I share with you later, but I actually think that should be the lens through which you view every major issue, um, whether it's economic, whether we're talking about national security, whether we're talking about the main cultural issues. You can actually look at all of those from the perspective of are we protecting kids or are we victimizing them? And as Christians, I would say your mandate in all of your life, including how you vote, needs to come down to protecting the least of these. Tony, if I may, I want to urge everybody in this audience, if you haven't done so, to read Katie's wonderful book, Them Before Us. Them refers to children before us adults. When we prioritize their interests, we pave the way to the flourishing of the entire society. And Katie, thank you for writing that book, which was just marvelous. Please do read it. Thank you for writing the foreword. Oh, well, uh, yeah, I had several people go. Then before us, Katie, Robert George. This must be a great book, and it is. <laughs> well, yes, that's true. The the opposite of that is what we've seen over the last two decades with the redefinition of marriage. It was about the pleasure of adults, not the children. And and look what has flown, what has flowed from that, where we're now we we can't even go into a restroom and be safe as, as a child. That all began with putting the desire of adults before the well-being of children. Britt, go ahead. No. I'll just say, that is how it's always been on social issues. You, look, you can look at any major social, you can look at abortion. It's always what the adults want at the expense of the child, right? And so I actually think that that is the common tie that binds most of the cultural issues. Certainly, I actually think with the economic and the national security and immigration issues as well, is who's whose rights or needs or desires are being elevated. And if it's the adults, it's the kids who will pay the price every time. Yeah. Brent, I, I, I want to come back to this directed discussion on the platform because someone's saying, well, you know, platform language doesn't really matter, you know, so they can say this, but they're going to do this. So it really doesn't matter what's in that printed document. Speak to that for a moment. Yeah, Tony, if you look at the research, what the research says, platforms matter a, a great deal. And like you were saying, a lot of people say, well, you know, maybe I don't agree with that specific candidate or that specific candidate, but what's the big deal on the platform? You know, a lot of people across the nation haven't actually read it. But if you look at the research, um, a professor at Stephen M. F. Austin University, he did extensive research on the party platforms and why they're so important. And he did, he did a deep dive. And what he found, he looked at the congressional votes, and he found that parties vote on average with their party platform over 80% of the time. And in the GOP, it was actually the higher end of the two between the two parties. So the Democrats was about 74% of the time, and then Republicans was 89%, almost 90 So when you change the party platform, you are changing those guiding principles. You are changing kind of that North Star, if you will. I, I kind of liken it to like the, the playbook. If you're on a football team, you know, you have different people uh, on the field covering different positions. They have different roles. But the reason they all work together is they've all memorized that playbook before they come and before they do that huddle. If you change the playbook, you are changing what success looks like. And that's what happened when you changed the party platform. You're saying what success looks like is now different. And that's what was so disappointing what we saw this summer. Well, as it pertains to the unborn, they're not even going to get off the bench if we uh, are going by the party platform. I, I want you, Dr. George, to address this issue that has been, is, is now being trumpeted by, well, I shouldn't have said that, uh, being stated by many politicians that uh, abortion is a state issue. <laughs> Only if we've read the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States out of the Constitution of the United States. The 14th Amendment says, among other things, that no person shall be denied by any state life, liberty, or property without due process of law, and no person shall be denied by any state within its jurisdiction, any person within its jurisdiction denied by any state the equal protection of the laws. You know that, Tony, and that means everybody. That means from the child in the womb to the frail elderly person at the point of, point of death. But, Tony, you know, even though you're not a lawyer, you're an old law enforcement guy, you know that the 14th Amendment doesn't end with that first section that has the due process clause and the privileges and immunities clause and the equal protection clause. It has five sections, 
And in the fifth is something very important. It's very important to read to the end. What do you find in the fifth section of the 14th Amendment? Congress, Congress, the Congress of the United States, shall, by appropriate legislation, enforce the provisions of this article. It is Congress's responsibility and not just Congress's right to confer, to ensure that every state confers on every person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Mic drop. End of story. This is not controversial. This states' rights thing, this attempt to return us to the situation that Stephen Douglas argued for against Abraham Lincoln in 1958, this is, if there could be nothing more contrary to the heritage and history and legacy of the Republican Party. How, how can an inalienable right be limited by the border of a state? There is no way. There is no way. Now, the situation prior to the 14th Amendment was different. Right. And, of course, the traditional abortion leg legislation that was put into place was prior to or at about the same time then as the 14th Amendment. But deviations that would have triggered Congress's authority to act only came in the 19, late 19. 60s and early 1970s. You're going beyond the Constitution, just to natural rights, to to inalienable rights that the con that the Declaration recognizes. Those aren't limited by borders. If you're going to be no, lost, no, it's a matter of, of of sound political philosophy. As a matter of justice, you're absolutely right. But of course, the Constitution does allocate authority right. over certain domains of life, as between the different levels of of government, and state authority is not derivative of national authority. Under our Constitution, which was unique in the world when it was introduced, the states have independent authority as governments of general jurisdiction exercising what are called police powers. The national government is a government of delegated and enumerated powers. If it hasn't been delegated a power, it didn't, doesn't have it. But what the 14th Amendment did in that fifth section, Tony, is delegate a new power, 1868 delegate a new power to the government of the United States, and that power is to enforce the guarantees, including the equal protection guarantee of the first section of the amendment. Yeah. Katie, so when we look at this as, as Christians, we, I mean, this pray, vote, stand summit. So we're, we're praying. We've seen that here. We're preparing to vote this is a difficult election. There's a lot at stake, as I've said before, and will continue to say this election won't save the country, but it could destroy it. How do we help Christians navigate this process of, this is not ideal. We don't have the best situation here. In fact, as we've been describing, and we can be honest, okay, we can say that the Republican Party has deviated from its historical stand for life. Okay, that is not heretical, it is fact. We can say that because we're never going to course correct the party if we don't talk about it. But that doesn't mean we don't vote. How do we navigate this? Well, I just say put kids first, right? That's, I find that that's kind of a hack for everything, um, you know, in conversations with friends, when looking at political issues, or even what to do when you're approaching an election, put kids first. And then that to me is a helpful lens, a helpful metric, a way to evaluate where to put your vote. And I actually think that children's life, family, mind, body, future, and security are all on the line when it comes to this next election. And I've got plenty of critiques of the GOP in relation to that. But I will tell you, when it comes to children's life, family, mind, body, security, and future, you can't think of anything going on on the other side of the aisle that is putting right. kids first. Right. It's really good. So I think that we need to be very clear-eyed, and our principles never bend to politicians. Yes. Our principles never bend to politicians. By God's grace, it will be the other way around. Politicians will bend to our biblically-based child protective principles. <laughs> but even if they don't, we won't. Even if the politicians are going to compromise or slide or justify a position that harms children, which always goes against scripture, we don't follow in their lead, right? We simply won't do it. It, it kind of tees up what I wanted to ask you, Brent, because there are some, and there's probably some in the room here that say, you know, just don't talk about these things because this is kind of baggage and it's going to discourage people. 
if we don't talk about it, we can't fix it. So, so speak to that. How do, how do we need to be approaching this? Absolutely. And Tony, I've worked for FRC Action for 10 years, the, the political side. Before that, I was working campaigns, and I've worked campaigns at all levels, so I get the importance of polling and the political calculus and all of that. But you can't start, you can't get your core principles from the polling. So right. when you're looking at these issues, you can't use that as your starting point. Those can't be your core values. If you're getting your core values from what the polling is saying, your core values are going to change every four years, and it's just not going to end well. So I think the starting point for that question is say, what are our core values? What is truth here? And I think um, just like Katie put so well in her book, showing people how fundamental these issues are that we're talking about. These are real people that are going to be impacted by these issues. These aren't just other issues, not that every issue isn't important, but we're not just talking about maybe increasing the income tax by a half a point or raising the speed limit a little bit. These are fundamental issues to who we are as a people. Like if you are willing to compromise the principle of we are all created by God with equal dignity and worth, if we compromise that principle here, th that affects the type of people that we become. Marriage and family are those types of issues too. So we have to start there. How many people are going to be impacted by this issue? And then once we know that in our core principles, I'm all for making persuasive arguments. You know, in public policy, sometimes you have incremental change. Right. But I think fundamentally the difference here is that it's a big difference to have incremental change in the right direction and proactive change in the wrong direction. And that's what we can't, that's what we can't have. And, and like you said, Tony, if we go silent on this, we're going to lose every argument that we don't make. Can I add something to that? I, I dare you if you're brave enough. Raise your hand if you've ever felt the temptation to not speak up because it was going to hurt a relationship in your life. Okay, so the left has very effectively used our need for social connection. We are social creatures. Robert George has written a lot about this. Um, and we actually need that relational connection, maybe as much or more as we need food. It is core and fundamental to what it means to be human, the proper understanding of what it means to be human. The left has so weaponized our relationships. They have threatened us with isolation, very real isolation, you know, from your workplace, for example, maybe your friend group, maybe even your children or your parents, depending on if you want to go up or down in that, um, you know, family framework. And so I understand the fear, right? Because like all of us have dealt with it. But I will tell you something. They are going to say things like you're on the wrong side of history. Yeah. Okay, you're on the wrong side of history. I have news for you. You are never going to be on the wrong side of history when you are on the right side of biblical truth. Yes. And you're never going to be on the wrong side of history when you're on the side of child protection. So you are going to have to make a calculation. Sometimes, you know, I will say that the other side, well, even people on our side will say, well, don't ruin the relationship. Maintain the relationship. If you elevate maintaining relationships to the status of God, truth is going to be sacrificed. Okay, so we don't do that. Okay, we keep truth as the highest value, and that means we will supremely value relationships, but they're not the ultimate good. There are times, sometimes, when you need to speak up, even if it means a relationship might be in jeopardy. So I would say that that's, that's a worthy calculation. And I think the reason why the left has gotten away with so much social overhaul, so much of the tearing apart of the social fabric, is because they have weaponized isolation and forced us into silence, and it cannot stay that way. I, I, I actually find it comical. I find it comical for those who say, oh, don't you feel like you're on the wrong side of history? Because they don't even know their history. Uh, <laughs> but speak to that, because this... There, there are many parallels in history to where we are today and the, it, that points to the way forward to, to continue to be a faithful witness, but not just a witness, but a witness that impacts and changes the future direction. So let me work backwards from more recent to more uh, distant. Um, I said a moment ago, we have things we can learn from the left. One of those things is to bear in mind how they prevailed. I still insist that it's a temporary victory, but they nevertheless for now have prevailed in the marriage struggle. Mm -hmm. 
Can you remember back in the early 2000s, in the 2000 aughts, when marriage was a 70-30 issue for the traditional marriage side? What happened? Left-wing activists in the Democratic Party put pressure on their leaders or those who sought leadership positions in their party and in their ideological movement to do what? To lead. To lead. They kept the pressure on. They weren't deterred by the fact that it was 70-30 against them. They didn't say, oh, we have to wait till we change culture and then we can change the law. They realized that you change culture in part by changing the law. Law is a teacher. That's what my dissertation was about. Uh, Law is a teacher. And law can change consciousness and opinion. When Hillary Clinton tried to hold back because she was worried about um, being identified with the traditional marriage, I'm sorry, with the, um, with the same-sex marriage cause because it was a 70-30 issue against her, they kept the pressure on her until she capitulated. Barack Obama began by claiming he was pro-traditional marriage. They kept the pressure on him until he capitulated. And in the end, they prevailed. There's a lesson in that for us. The next time somebody tells you that, oh, we can't do anything for now on the life issue or on any other issue because, you know, we haven't changed the culture, we have to change the culture, and then we'll change the law because law is downstream from culture or politics is downstream from culture, just remember that's a half-truth. That's a half-truth. And what my mother told me is a half-truth is another word for a lie, a falsehood. Yeah, politics is affected by culture, no doubt about that. But politics affects everything else in culture as well. Now let's go back further. Martin Luther King was unpopular even on the left, and yet he kept up his witness and he kept up his struggle and he would not be intimidated into backing down because he knew what he was fighting for was right. Or let's go back even further. Let's go back, Tony, to the very roots of the Republican Party. The first Republican platform was in 1856, a new party made of the conscience Whigs, the Whigs who were opposed to slavery. And in that very first platform, this party pledged itself to two principles, this Republican Party. This is what the new party would stand for. And those principles were not even important things like economic freedom uh, or uh, lower taxes. You know what those two principles were? They were going to fight for marriage, Right. And for human dignity, they pledged themselves to oppose the twin relics of barbarism. What were they? Slavery and polygamy. Slavery treating a human being as if he's a disposable object or a thing. Sound familiar? Polygamy undermining the very idea, the concept of marriage as the exclusive and permanent and faithful union of husband and wife. If we give up on these moral issues, we have abandoned the heritage and legacy of the party, the thing that brought the Republican Party into being in the first place. Katie, you touched on this, and and I, I, I think this is the practical application of our few minutes left here in this panel is... All right, how do we be faithful witnesses in in an increasingly hostile culture? Because it begins to build on itself, and you've got corporate America, and you've got laws and policies now that are speaking the opposite of what we're talking about here. So how do we we go forward with a, a clarion call of truth, of righteousness, of biblical justice, and not be intimidated and not be angry? Because I, I do not think we can operate out of anger. I think some anger is okay. That's why I... <laughs> angry at the right things is okay. But you're right. It, you can't, that's not the engine that can drive the machine at all. Um, so how do you move forward? Well, I'll tell you what. You know, we've been doing it in Seattle. We've raised our four kids in Seattle. And um, we're a, a massive minority going on there. But I'll tell you something. People are waking up. Like what, where we are in, you know, here is not where we were 10 years ago, even though we've experienced an exodus, you know, not through the Red Sea, but to the red states. Um, The people that are still in Seattle actually are ready to fight because they understand the cost of the lies that are being crammed down their throats in terms of the governance in Seattle, but also down their kids' throats. Now, we don't have a lot of voting power in Seattle. 
But I'll tell you what we've got. We know how to raise our kids now. We're very serious about discipling our children. So we know what we're going to do for the next generation. Number two, we have started to form these little underground pods where nobody can find us, right? We've got these little communication groups where we strengthen and reinforce one another. We bring more people into the fold and then those people are strengthened as well. We coach each other on how to deal with difficult challenges, like how to stand up in your work at workplace, what to say to your kid when they come home with this impossible assignment or whatever it is. And I will tell you something, we are making converts. We're making converts because the other side has so overplayed their hand. They are so wildly out of touch. The connection between their bad ideas and the victimization of everybody, but especially the most vulnerable, is obvious. I mean, this is a target-rich environment. So what is my advice to you? Number one, don't bend. They will come back to us right? We are, there's going to be influence one way or the other. Either the world is going to influence us or we're going to influence them. And for a long time, they've been influencing us and that needs to end. Mm -hmm. Okay. So number two, you have to be an expert, be an expert on what God says in his word, but then also be an expert on all these different subjects as it relates to voting. You should know more about this than everybody else. Yeah. And when you get into a conversation with one of your friends, you should be able to say, actually, Immigration is not compassionate. Do you know that the immigration services have lost between 30,000 and 300,000 unaccompanied migrant children that are probably somewhere in the seedy underbellies of the trafficking world in this country? We need to shut the border for the sake of children. You need to know more about this than everyone else. And then finally, if all else fails, we need to breed them out. Have more babies and raise them up. <laughs> well, we just lost our G rating for this panel. Okay. You know, I, uh, we only have a minute left, Robbie, but I got to ask you this question because it just prompted me. I, was, I flew through Seattle uh, last month. It's very nice from 30,000 feet. No, I was in the airport in Seattle and... I, walk, I got off, and all of these huge lines back into the, the walkway of the airport, and I was trying to figure out what was going on. I thought maybe, and it was all outside of bathrooms. Then I realized they're all same-sex bathrooms. I mean, they're all unisex bathrooms. Everybody uses the same one. And, of course, every line was long because they're just, everybody's waiting in line. I said, this is crazy. And does history show us that the policies and the ideas of the left eventually implode on them and people come to their senses? Well, here I think we need to be very careful not to um, indulge in wishful thinking. <laughs> it's not true that history will always self-correct. It's not true that we can just wait around doing nothing and the craziness of the left will result in something that corrects the craziness of the left. We have no guarantee of that. The way things actually change is when people make decisions, when they make choices, when they act, when they make sacrifices, when they take risks, when they lead. We'd be a different world today if it weren't for Winston Churchill, a particular individual, making particular choices, which were very unpopular at the time, and standing up against the prospect of Nazi tyranny. Individual human beings, leaders, can make a difference. Individual human beings, ordinary citizens, can make a difference, and that difference won't necessarily be made if we just stand back and expect history to self-correct. The idea that history has a determined course, that's an idea on the left. They get it from Marx, who got it from Hegel, if you want to know the intellectual lineage of it. We don't have it because we don't believe in it. We don't believe that history has an inevitable direction or that it will self-correct or reach the right result in the end, except at the very end when Jesus returns right. in, in glory. So it is up to us exercising those great virtues, those theological virtues of faith, hope, and love to make a better world. We have to make history. Make history. All right, Brent, Kylan, you get the last word because we are out of time, but there's resources available to help do exactly what Katie was talking about, the voter toolkit. Talk about that very quickly so people can get a copy of that. 
Absolutely. So this is uh, being released in tandem with Prevote Pray Vote Stand Summit. This is the 2024 voter toolkit. Uh, you can find it um, in the new uh, FRC Stand Firm app. So just download the Stand Firm app and then look for the voter toolkit. Um, included in it will be voter guide information, uh, resources to get others involved, voter registration information, also prayer points as we pray over these next 30 days between now and the election. So it's kind of a kind of a one-stop shop for folks. It's free. Hope you download that and share that with others. And you can get that by texting toolkit to 67742. That's toolkit to 67742. Will you thank our wonderful panel once again? <laughs>